I am I am Austin Mulka. I'm Ali Halal. And I'm Noah Michael. <laughs> and we have Noah Michael, and this is SFL on Air. Noah, could you tell us about yourself? Yeah, so I am a newly minted Students for Liberty campus coordinator. I've been in the movement for about three months, but jumped in with uh, both feet forward. I've worked with Young Americans for Liberty and Turning Point USA as well. And I care a lot about free markets and, and uniting the movement toward towards a common goal. So that's that's kind of what I care about. We have, haven't have met Noah yet, but we are going to be Noah on the, the retreat in Nashville. And I would I wanted to tell Noah a little something about Ali. I've been best friends with Ali for a long time. And Ali is blessed. He is blessed because there's this problem that everyone has called deciding what to eat. You ever have this problem? Yeah, it, it, happen, it happens all the time. It's a very common problem. See, Ali has Crohn's disease. He doesn't have this problem. He can only eat at like two places. <laughs> That's... See, see, you know, it's a bad thing, but, but at, at the very least, you get to dodge that problem. So, you know, ups and downs, man, ups and downs. I enjoy my vegan shakes. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. What, what are the two restaurants you can eat at? Morning Star Burgers. Uh, they're vegan. <laughs> Yeah, there's like barely any vegan places around here. You eat so. at Chipotle all the time. Are I do eat Chipotle. Are you allowed to or you just do anyway? Since I have like a mild dairy intolerance, I can pretty much eat almost anything I want. So yeah, I eat at Chipotle and I get like cheese and stuff all the time on oh, my really? stuff. Yeah. Huh. It's not that big of a deal. I am the most boring person at Chipotle. I get double steak rice in a burrito. I'm I'm a boring human being. <laughs> Yeah, man, it's all about the the guac. That's what you gotta get. I've never <laughs> been a guac guy, but but I, I have to try theirs. So Noah, I hear you like books. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really like books. Um, I it's kind of I, I don't want to say addiction, but I buy a lot of books and I and I read a lot of books. And one of the things I really care about is w when you're jumping into Liberty and you're watching videos and you think this stuff's interesting, you hear a bunch of titles thrown out. You hear Rothbard's Man Economy and State, and you hear Mises' Human Action, and then, and then someone talks about the road to serfdom, and, and obviously, like, this is completely meaningless to anyone who is, is new to the movement and, and doesn't, like, has no idea what people are talking about. So, one of the things I try to do is I talk a lot about where to start in terms of literature and, and getting into it, because A, I love reading, but two, um, in in order to be effective people for our movement, we have to know our stuff and, and know how to communicate it well. So books are easily the clearest path to doing it. You can learn a lot from the content on like Learn Liberty, but if you really want to get into the meat of stuff, uh, reading books is, is the path to go. Here's what I think we should do. It'll be fun. I'll consider you like the book expert. I'm going to give you three books that I think are the three most important, and then Ollie can give you three books, and then you can judge our books, judge our opinions, and then you give your three essential books. So, I will be clear, in terms of essential books, what I'm going to give as my three are the first three books you should read when you're new to the movement. There's a lot of things that I do, a lot of books that I enjoy. For example, I've read Atlas Shrugged, which is a thousand-page novel by one of the greatest thinkers of all time, Ayn Rand. But it's not where I would, like, outside of, outside of pure enjoyment, it's not where I would recommend someone new to the movement start. So you guys give me your three essential books, and then I'll give you my three that I would start with. My first one is going to be The Two Treaties of Government. By, by Locke? By Locke. Okay, so fantastic. In terms of the beginnings of the classical liberal tradition, anything by Locke, but especially the two treaties of government, really, really laid the groundwork, especially for the natural rights arguments and later on in the libertarian movement. So, 10 out of 10. All right, good. And then the second one I'm going to do, I'm not sure if this is essentially a liberty book, but it's the strongest critique to liberty. It's about uh -huh. liberty. So I think it's important to read, to know the counter-arguments, and the strongest of which I think is uh, Rousseau and his... Uh, the Social Contract? The Social Contract, or the, the Leviathan by Hobbes. Those are both fantastic things to know. Also going back to, to the same time period as Locke, 
important things to know the counter arguments that would definitely read both of those. Alright, and then my last one is going to be controversial, but it's The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided in Politics by Jonathan Haidt. It was a recent book, it was written in 2016. Okay, so I haven't read that one, but I will make sure to add it. What's, what kind of, what, what, what stuff does it cover? He basically goes over... Jonathan Haidt's a social psychologist, yeah, by the way. So. He makes a libertarian argument for a combination of liberal and conservative ideals. That, that's, that's really interesting. I'm going to have to look into that. Um, I really like the work of, and, and we're going to be talking about this at the retreat, but some of the, the psychological work uh, and how it relates to politics. conversation with Dr. Peterson really was interesting in showing, showing the bridge between that, so I'll have to check that out. Yeah, your conversation was with, P- with uh, Peterson was like awesome. It was one of the I can't remember which question it was you were talking about that interested me. I think it was the one with like how people's environments reflect their political views. Like the oh, yeah. big city people will be more rural, and then the rural areas will be more uh, conservative. I, I will say the the one thing that I admired so much about that conversation is you were so relaxed and just talk to him like a dude, whereas I, I see myself like if I was talking to like Rand Paul or Ron Paul, I would just have to like curtail the fanboy. Jordan Peterson, I knew I could just, I didn't have to think about what I said, I could just say it, and he would understand yeah. what I was saying. Yeah, yeah so that, that was super cool. So Ollie, oh, yeah, give my me books, your books. Well, the one I'm reading right now is uh, Free Market Environmentalism. I remember the author. It's really cool because I am a green libertarian. I do, I do care a lot about the environment and what we can do in a free market way without the state getting involved. You actually took my pick for the lock book. It's mm-hmm. a great book. It's essential. It's very important. I think that's interesting. Free market environmentalism. I haven't read the book, but I've read I've read another book that. If you are a green libertarian, I also recommend you read if you if you're if you're interested. There's a guy named Alex Epstein that wrote a book called The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels that simply laid out the reasons why fossil fuels are beneficial to the environment compared to them being detrimental. Now, now granted, that, that sounds crazy, especially to anyone who's of the political left or cares about the environment. But I definitely recommend it. It's an interesting book. He's done some talks. He goes into a lot of interesting arguments about the, the benefits of fossil fuels. Right before Ali's third book, I'm going to blow your mind. In Canada, there is a research team where they've been able to extract CO2 from the atmosphere. Not only have they been able to extract CO2 from the atmosphere, they can turn it into pellets that can be used as a renewable fuel source. Okay, so... All we have to, well, that, that, that's incredible because what that means is not only is it beneficial for us to continue burning fossil fuels, but you'll be able to turn it into more energy. This is a perfect example of innovation and creativity in the marketplace being there to get us to a more flourishing human condition as opposed to centrally planned government. All right, so yeah, Ollie, what's, then, your, what's your number three? I was going to say Ayn Rand's book, but you're right. It might not be the most accessible book to most people. If you read Ayn Rand quotes from wiki quotes for like 30 minutes or 45 minutes, you'll get the gist of the philosophy. Yeah, she's very yeah, memorable. She had a collection called For the New Intellectual, which was a combination of big blocks from... Uh, of speeches and stuff from her three major novels, that being uh, We Are Living, uh, The Fountainhead, and Atlas Shrugged, so that the things that kind of encapsulated her ideas in her novels in one play. Uh, she was my introduction to, to Liberty, and then I kind of, I, I still feel somewhat of a bond with objectivism, but I, I kind of moved away towards more of an ANCAP philosophy. You know what? I will stick with the Ayn Rand's book. Atlas Shrugged? I, yeah, I would, I would have to. Just because it's just, there's so many quotables in the book itself. So for those who aren't familiar, we're, we're talking about it just as a quotable quote book, but it's a long fiction novel broken into three parts. 
about a railroad company head named Agni Tagger and a series of mysteries and things, and it's, it's, it's got bits of philosophy and politics and, and economics, all these wonderful little pieces that are, are encapsulated in this great long mystery about engineers and artists disappearing from the world. It's an incredible book, and it's, it's my favorite story of all time, and I, I love the book so much. But So now for my three, or, or four, three plus one. So, in terms of philosophy, the three books I would recommend. The first book I recommend you read is A Law by Friedrich Bastiat. I mentioned that we would get back to Hobbes and Rousseau. Bastiat was a French economist, and in the 19, or sorry, in the 1850s, he wrote this essay. It's, it, you can get it as a book, but it's only like 50 pages. And it basically talks about how the law, by, by governance, completely perverts rights and freedoms and takes our stuff away for the ability to manipulate citizens. And he has bits from both Rousseau and Hobbes and tons of other political philosophers from the classical liberal, from the, the time period where, where the classical liberal tradition was kind of beginning. It was a kind of a opposition to that. So on the other side of things, one of the major things that I really care about and I think is important for us as libertarians to understand is economics. And if, if I were to recommend one book, it'd be Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson as, as the first economics book. It's right at 200 pages. It opens with simply a, a two-page thing called The Lesson, which simply says economics has to be looked at by applying a proposed policy to all groups, not just one group, and we have to look at both the short-term and the long-term effects rather than just the short-term effects. Then the next 180 pages is using, through this lens of this one lesson, looking at all of these different economic fallacies, and it hits everything. It hits, it starts with the broken window fallacy, goes into what war does to an economy, it touches on tariffs, it describes what Milton Friedman often talked about, which was uh, the price system, it hits everything, and then at the end summarizes the lesson again after we've gone through all of these facts about economics. It's an incredible book and, and definitely a read for anyone new to, to reading about economics. Well, uh, what's the name of that book? Uh, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. I would definitely recommend you read it. And, the, and then the third book, if, if I have to pick one, and, I, and I've been going back and forth on a couple different ones, but I think I have to go with Ron Paul's The Revolution Manifesto for a couple of reasons. One, Ron Paul is seen today as one of the primary... Like he kind of reignited the liberty movement, and, and this is going to be controversial, but with Young Americans for Liberty coming out of the Students for Ron Paul movement, kind of him being an important figure, his son's a senator, I think that reading one of his works as an introduction is great. The other reason that I would absolutely recommend reading it is, it's again short, I'm not going to give someone a 700-page book like Human Action to someone new to the movement, and he hits on everything he starts with, just describing the state of the United States. In the foreword, the famous quote, truth is treason in an empire of lies, that's where that comes from. And then he hits everything. He goes foreign policy to the Constitution, to civil liberties, to economic freedom, touches on the financial crisis and the Fed. In terms of modern libertarian discussion, it's a lot of things that are very important. It sounds like Rand Paul needs to read this book. Yeah, Rand Paul does. Okay, in Rand's defense, he's in a tough spot right now, but yeah, voting for Jeff Sessions, uh, I'm, I'm still a little salty about that. I wouldn't have had a problem with the immigration ban either if it was targeting correct areas. At least, at least temporarily, but it missed Saudi Arabia. One of the things I will say, Rand Paul does get a 10 out of 10 recently, though, because he pushed a bill in the Senate to cut off the weapons deal of Saudi Arabia, which yeah. I, can, mm -hmm. I can thoroughly appreciate. I have to include a fourth book. It, it, it's the most important book that you will read if you want to do activism, plan events, and work to do actual change. 
and that's uh, Solinsky's Rules for Radicals. You absolutely need to read Solinsky's Rules for Radicals. Sargon Makat does a 45-minute analysis on his channel talking about the book, but Solinsky was a Jewish American, one of the forerunners of, of the progressive movement. Uh, he was the mentor to both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, so not exactly a fan of liberty, he was actually a small c communist. But what his book talks about, it, it has little to no political rhetoric. The book is about community organizing and working to achieve causes, and he talks about everything from power to the use of certain words. And there's a, there's a very great chapter simply called Tactics, which goes into, I think it's 11 different things he calls power tactics. Let me actually get some highlights. I was actually going to ask, how do you usually read your books? Is it audio? Do you actually take the time to read it? I have a paper book, guys, so I have a stack of books next to me. As much as I love books, I have trouble paying attention. I read best late at night when it's really quiet because it gives me time to focus. Last night I reread Rothbard's Anatomy of the State essay. I read straight through and then I dedicate five to ten minutes after I'm done reading. I often have a notebook next to me and I write down my thoughts simply because it improves uh, retaining the information. Back to rules for radicals. So it's, it's 13 rules and I won't go through all of them, but he talks about things like power is not only what you have but what the enemy thinks you have. Power is derived from two main sources, money and people. Liberty movement, we have some money, but primarily we're a grassroots organization full of people. He talks about doing things with people, things like keep the pressure on. It's all about community organizing and working together to change the power. One of the best lines in the book is he talks about compromise, which is a bit of a dirty word, but, but put simply, I will never compromise principle. But when you're talking about actual policy, let's say the establishment has 100% and you have 0%, you demand 100% and they give you 30%, you're 30% ahead. So, and bringing liberty back to the United States using these tactics. And it's all about nonviolent conflict, so not using guns for revolution, but talking to people, getting people to, to unite for a common cause. So oh. he would say that everyone needs to go to patreon.com slash SFL on air and donate money so we can unite as a community and help each other. Is that what you're saying? That, that is 100% all that I was talking about. Nothing about, you know, trying to change policies. Washington. No, it's all, about, it's all about funding. Go get my boy Austin and my boy Ali some money on patreon.com slash SFL on air. And then we have one more thing we wanted to talk about, which kind of comes into here. I am a strong believer in unifying behind the movement. There's a lot of different things that people say about libertarianism as being, okay, you have to believe this or you're not part of our, our group. In my opinion, the things that connect libertarians and make it so that we're able to work together is the humility to say that you're wrong, the freedom to express ideas, and the openness to work together and find a solution. And when you have freedom and the humility to say, these are my ideas, I'm willing to listen to your ideas in a non-aggressive manner, I think that's what combines us. And I think personal beliefs shouldn't dictate that, disregarding the non-aggression principle, of course. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And I think that one of the things we've lost in our modern political discourse is we've stopped talking about ideas, and it's all come down to a team right versus team left thing. They want to pick a team and stay on that team. It becomes like sports or something. And then what ends up happening is like it's not as much that people want to be right as in people just don't want to be wrong. Because it sucks to be wrong. It's, it's crazy, actually. Conservative and um, federal attorney for USA, Charlie Kirk, wrote in his book about ending the game between team right and team left and focusing on the actual continuum which exists, which is more freedom and less freedom. One of my favorite jokes, uh, what's the difference between a group of libertarians and, and a bunch of cats? What? Uh, you can actually sometimes get the cats together to do something productive and stop arguing. Um, uh, but uh, one of the things we have to start doing is finding ways to work together with, with our fellow 
libertarians, regardless of what specific ideology you follow, and find ways to move the bar closer to freedom rather than us fighting as the bar gets closer to authoritarianism. One of one of the, the things that I'm, I'm doing is, so currently we have a YAL chapter down at, our, at my university in Missouri. I go to a school in Rolla, Missouri. But what we're going to do is we're becoming what, what's called the Missouri s and Liberty Coalition. And, and kind of the purpose of this is, is to open ourselves up to saying we understand that we have differences but what's more important is opening up our, our doors to work with anyone who would like to promote more freedom and dislikes less freedom. So we're opening our doors up to left libertarians or mutualists. Um, we're also opening the doors to conservatarians, people like Rand Paul or Mike Lee, who, while we might not agree on some social issues, if we can unite on some common goals of things like free speech, we can really push those things hard and find the fact that I as an anarcho-capitalist, our chapter's president as a minarchist, and a group of other people of whatever ideology they have, if we can find these common points and hit these hard, we can actually do some good rather than just be a bunch of cats fighting. Yes, I have a lot of solutions. It doesn't solve the who's right, but it solves a lot of problems. For example, with the gun issue between the left and the right. Theoretically speaking, if there was a non-lethal weapon which was more effective than a gun, guns would become obsolete. Looking for a non-lethal alternative that was quicker and more efficient than a gun would solve the gun problem. Everyone wants to increase the minimum wage to $15. Why not a minimum wage that increases concurrently with GDP per capita and inflation? What I've noticed is that it just all it does is hurt small businesses. And then you'll hear people, you know, ask Bernie Sanders at like these town hall meetings, like, hey, I'm a small business owner. A higher minimum wage is actually hurting my but company, the BK. But the 1%. Yeah. So, like, They're not pay- okay, so there's these well, small business right, owners that are on. <laughs> yeah, like, these small business owners, they're forced to you know pay for their uh employees medical benefits they're you know they have all these benefits that they have to pay for and on top of that they're they're they have to pay for this increasing minimum wage and they're putting uh their credit card on their payroll just to support their payroll and then so it's it's like a tough situation you put a small business owner at when they're forced to have all these benefits and this high minimum wage. Small businesses should not have to t- pay taxes. None, in my opinion. Yeah, well, I, I think no one should have to pay taxes, but that's, that's my true. in-cap speaking. No, but but I, I think one of the one of the biggest things we need to do, and I need to give credit where credit is due, um, organizations like the Foundation for Economic Education and the and, and the Mises Institute and Learn Liberty all do great work in that. Uh, improving economic literacy is the quickest way to show people that, that some of these policies are actually harmful to small businesses and the poor. Because essentially what the minimum wage is, it's an effective price floor on, on labor. It, it sure as hell sounds great if you want $15 an hour, but in fact it's going to hurt, especially if, if we're going to talk about who's really impacted by this, let's talk about immigrants who get, who, who are trying to get on their feet. They won't be able to enter the labor market if they're a $15 minimum wage. If you are a poor kid in the inner cities, good luck getting a job if there's a $15 minimum wage because in order to enter the labor market, you need to have enough skills so that it's worth paying $15 an hour. It's, it's, it's very detrimental to, uh, uh, the, 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 the poor to have a minimum wage. Uh, I was, I was just gonna, I was actually gonna bring that up. Like, whatever racial bias there may be, as far as like, oh, who is, is, is like a black person getting paid as much as a white person? Well, all you did was, you just, you hurt the person trying to get a job that may not have as well of an education whether it be, you know, black or white, there was some racial motive that's behind the minimum wage, and I can't remember what it was. I was just reading on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, so this came up in, if you, if you watch the Rubin Report, he did an episode with Deirdre McCloskey, who's, who's a, uh, a Chicago economist, 
the minimum wage was originally created to price immigrants, black people, Hispanics, uh, and Native Americans out of the labor market because of of the the cheap labor that they that they wanted. They were willing to be paid less because they needed a job. So the minimum wage was created with a racist motive. Yeah. It, it doesn't help out anybody when there's somebody who's willing to work less and then you can't pay them now because... Yeah. Yes, businesses and politicians are always going to try to exploit the consumer and exploit employees. One of the great things about capitalism is that I can say, hey, I want to make money playing video games and I can tell a bunch of people and I can stream online and people will pay me to play video games. That type of innovation doesn't really happen quite like in the United States, anywhere else in the world. Have you seen the, Noah, have you seen the tournaments for, like, uh, League of Legends and uh, yeah, Dota 2? Yeah, he's yeah, it's crazy. It's so, like a football like... stadium. There's analysts in suits yeah. talking about people on a computer. There's a big stage, and there's computers on the stage, and people are playing video games, and they're getting paid millions of dollars. And, like, there's fans are cheering. There's sites dedicated to analysis of this, and I think, and I think finally, like, a way, to, a way to finish this up is with a quote from uh, the, the, the great economist Milton Friedman. I, I'm more of an Austrian school guy, but he was right here where he said, A society that puts equality before freedom will get neither. A society that puts freedom before equality will get a high degree of both. Yes, yeah. one of my favorite quotes. All right, well, thank you, Noah. Uh, no, what's your Twitter handle? Where can they follow you at? Facebook? Um, uh, you can follow me on both uh, Twitter and Instagram, although I'm not too active on Twitter, at at N-J-M-I-C-K-E-L. That's N-J Michael. Uh, it's just my first two initials and my last name. Uh, and then uh, add me on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash Noah.Michael. As well as I help run the SFL on Air Facebook page. Make sure to go like the SFL on Air Facebook page, uh, follow the Liberty.me RSS feed, and like Students for Liberty on Facebook. Talk to you guys later. Well, thanks for doing my job. It was perfect. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, also uh, patreon.com slash SFL on Air. Support the podcast. We'll continue putting out more content. I was uh, going bald. We need money. We need money for... Uh, we need Rogaine. We need no, Rogaine. Ollie! It's all right. I'm fine with it. Uh, and uh, we need money for uh, food. Because you can't have a hungry podcaster or else they will not talk. You need those vegan shakes and you need that Chipotle. Heck yeah. Um, well, thank you for watching, for listening to the podcast. It's been a pleasure. See you next time. Thank you for watching SFL On Air. Click on the left to support our Patreon page. Click on the right to watch another episode. And click on the middle channel icon to subscribe.